I don't think that's the right track. <laughs> Whoops. Well. All right. Now it's kicking into gear. Hey, we are Journals Out Loud. I am your lovely and captivating host, Louise Palenker. Did you like our catchy theme music? We're, uh, we're in the middle of writing a new song for our new name. Now, we went from our place to Journals. We are an app in the iTunes App Store that is designed to uh, give advice to kids and nurture communication and uh, friend making and all that good stuff that people need along the way to help them grow up and become awesomer. We're here with a panel of wise and wonderful teens. We have Olivia, Jake, Montana, Aaron, Rhody, Andre, Justin's in the booth, and in our studio is our guest, the wonderful Craig Lofton, who is a Cal State Fullerton professor, and he teaches history and has a specialty in LGBTQ studies and has written some awesome books. This one is called One, or Letters to One, and One was the first, uh, how would you describe it, Craig? The first openly LGBT openly. magazine. Openly LGBT uh, magazine. And I'm really eager to read this book and to hear you read excerpts from this book. Describe what's in this book. That book is an edited collection of letters that people wrote to the magazine. The magazine was around from 1953 to 1967. And uh, for a while, it was the only openly gay magazine. It was sold on newsstands. Thousands of copies sold every uh, month. People subscribed to it. Um, it was the beginning of any gay media. All gay magazines, all gay websites owe an homage to this magazine. And so who was the wheezy of one? The who, wheezy? Who answered the letters? Oh, who answered the letters? <laughs> the, an the guy who answered the letters was named, he had, his name was Dorleg, and he's this kind of odd footnote in uh, LGBT history, very important Los Angeles activist. Um, he'd actually been an academic, and uh, when he was middle-aged, he was arrested in Detroit in a gay bar. This was back when you could get arrested simply for being in a gay bar, regardless of what you're doing or what's going on. This is when it was illegal to be gay across the country, and thousands and thousands and thousands of men and women lost their livelihoods and uh, had their lives destroyed by invasive police tactics. He was one of those people, moved out to Los Angeles for a new start, and right at the time he moved in the early 1950s was the very beginning of the modern gay rights movement. People often think that the gay rights movement started in the 60s and it started in uh, New York City with the Stonewall Riots, but actually it was in Southern California, 1950. First organization was called the Mattachine Society and one was the second organization, which kind of broke off from the Mattachine and their whole main purpose was to publish this magazine, to try to get their affirmative message out, to try to mobilize LGBT people all across the country and the world um, people read it all over the world into kind of a gay rights consciousness and to begin educating straight society that we are not the monsters that you think we are. So was it legal to publish a magazine about illegal activity? At first, nobody was sure. And they just said, well, we're just going to go ahead and do it and free speech, you know, right. uh, shouldn't be a crime just to talk about it. Um, Montana, yes. how did they have gay bars if simply like being gay was illegal they were run by mafias and and uh -huh. mafia syndicates it was they were very underground uh -huh. but they were tolerated a lot by cops okay um, so it wasn't like well explicitly like illegal but like it was kind of a thing it's complicated you know yeah. th there were laws on the books uh -huh. that you could be arrested for at any time being theoretically gay. yes for being in a certain place they had all these strange laws um, you know, that they could use and enforce against people who they knew to be gay. Like they would That's say like, ridiculous. okay, well, this is a bar, but it's actually illegal for you to engage in certain sexual activities. It's, it's not even sexual activities. It was just being in the bar. It really? is, this is a known place of vagrancy. And so you get a vagrancy arrest wow. and, and it gets written up kind of as a gay thing. Uh, what is vagrancy, by the way? I don't know the definition. It means of being a, a social pest in some way, you know, being a, it's a very it's a deliberately vague term that police uh -huh. use to arrest whoever they want to arrest. Yeah. OK. And, so doesn't and it usually mean just hanging out and and disrupting a business because you're on the sidewalk setting up like a picnic or something? Um, it could be that it could be all sorts of things. I mean. Here's what happened, you know, to sort of um, get to your question here. Uh, you, you know, in a lot of cities, police would sort of tolerate these places. But when it became election season and the, the mayor and the police chief had to prove to their constituents that they were doing a good job and, you know, protecting yeah. people, they would go round up 
they would literally arrest hundreds of gay people in these big rounds. And then they could say, oh, look how, look how well we're protecting people. We, we arrested hundreds of um, perverts, or they'd use some word like that yeah. to sort of uh, say, look, we're doing a good job. So it came in waves and it was sporadic. You could be gay, go to a gay bar for 10 years, not have any problems. Then all of a sudden one night, mm -hmm. Not only might you get arrested, but but the LAPD especially went out of their way to make sure that your name got in the newspaper oh. yeah. and your picture and your address and your phone number. Wow. And all that would be publicized in the um, in the news the next day. And very if you often. had a job. That's ridiculous. Say goodbye to it. Wow. Most likely, you know, mm -hmm. some people that didn't happen. Um, but but this was this was a real phenomenon that, that used to happen. I, I tell my students this and they can't believe just that it used to be gay. I mean, we're sitting here talking about marriage rights and whether it should be legal for gay people to get married. And it's like within my lifetime, I'm not that old, but within my lifetime, when I was born, these laws were still in effect in California. All right. Well, what, how have you studied um, the history of being gay over 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 all of history because it seems to me like there's always been gay people and so have you studied how different societies throughout the world have handled it uh throughout time or do we just have the records where where there's recorded history or is it something that interests you oh it definitely interests me yeah. um i think you know wherever you look you find it Mm -hmm. And um, my my specific focus is more on the 20th century and on the United States, um, although I, I do kind of have a good global sense of, of the 20th century. But when, when you hear about Michelangelo or Richard the Lionhearted yeah. being gay, did, did everybody know they were gay? And were they like, oh, cool? Um, well, first of all, let me let me say, and this is kind of interesting for people who've never heard this, that the word homosexual itself mm -hmm. and, and the specific concept that we use of a gay person is actually a very modern one. Okay. The word homosexual was not even uh, derived until like the, the 1860s. Oh, wow. And not even translate into English until a couple decades after that. Um, and that reflects, you know, scientific categorizations and, and, and industrialization and all these other historical trends that are kind of underlying that at that time. Before that, there's always equivalence. There's always people who we can look back and recognize, okay, that's what we would think of as a gay person mm -hmm. or a transgender person, mm -hmm. although they often would merge and blend in kind of complex ways. But let me say that this is actually a big debate among LGB historians. Okay. The extent to which we can go back and apply a word like gay to someone like Michelangelo mm -hmm. or Socrates, mm -hmm. or, you know, you name it, Alexander the Great, you know. And, and I would say, you know, if you're looking at it from the perspective of kind of an activist, if you're a movement person and you want to inspire people, then, then you throw that around a lot. You say, yeah, man, Alexander the Great, he was the greatest military hero of all time, and he was gay. And everyone knew it, but it was kind of understood differently back then, and it fit into their family structures back then because they had different family structures, different political structures. Everything was different, so the way they viewed sexuality in all sorts of forms was very, very different. Um, Sometimes there's persecution. Sometimes it's completely normal and ingrained into whatever social system exists. Okay. So it's, it's, I, I, we always feel, at least we feel like in the past 10 or 15 years, that, that things are improving very, very rapidly. But I do sometimes wonder if there were like, it was a, a 500 year period of time in a certain area of Europe where it was like, yeah, it's a preference. It's like you like licorice or you don't like licorice. You, you want to have sex with men. You want to have, like, wh why should it matter? And were there, long periods of time during which it didn't matter? Um, you know, yeah, that, that breaks down and depends uh, when you're talking about. There's times when it certainly did matter and times that were just as rep much more repressive mm -hmm. than we had in the 20th century. You know, I mean, like the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, they were targeting... Not just the Jews? Not just the Jews. Well, Jews and gay people, th it often happens together. With my brother, you know. it did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the Holocaust, of course, you know, right. that there were a, a lot of gay victims of the Holocaust as well. And, and it's, you know, when there's extreme persecution moments, you know, gay people have often been very convenient scapegoats to be thrown in. It feels like whenever there's extremely right-wing moments where it's kind of fear and hate-based kind of reasoning, 
It's like, well, who isn't extremely normal? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> right, exactly. And so I'd say LGBT people have been targets historically, but there have been periods when it, it isn't a problem. Ancient mm -hmm. Greece, for example, is the most famous example, mm -hmm. you know? Um, a lot of people don't know this, but this, I think, you know, is, is an important piece of information that in Native American cultures, um, this went underground during colonization, but for, say, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, almost every Native American culture had people in their tribes who, today we use the phrase, who would be called two-spirit. Oh. People who we would think of more as transgender. Mm -hmm. um, these were people who, at a very young age, four or five or six, uh, the, the, the mothers raising the children would notice mm -hmm. that the boy prefers doing the girl things. The oh. girl wants to be a warrior. Mm -hmm. And instead of doing what we do, which is freak out and, and you know send them to a psychiatrist and try to fit them into this mold... Uh, it was ingrained in their society to just, just go with that. Like and this say, person is special. And, uh, um, special or just, well, okay, separate the boys and the girls, and that one's going to be a, raised with the girls. Wow. And then the two-spirit person, if it's someone biologically male, would um, do the female roles, dress like a woman, really? do all of the, the female things, and very often marry someone who is also biologically male. I like to say this because when people say, oh, marriage has always been between a man and a woman, uh -huh. it's like, well, no. not on this continent for the last 10,000 years, <laughs> if you actually look at it, you know, in the broad sense of things. That's wonderful. But they didn't think of it as gay marriage like we do because they saw the two-spirit person not as a transgender person, right. but as somebody who had both spirits, mm -hmm. both gender spirits. And every tribe, it was a little different. It broke down a little bit differently. Um, in some tribes, they were kind of stigmatized. In others, they were exalted and more likely to be chiefs, more likely to be shaman. Um, go to any culture anywhere around the world, go back a little ways, dig around, and you'll find queer people. That's and queer people who have been leaders, dominant figures in society mm -hmm. all throughout history. Wow, that's fascinating. Any questions, panel, for Craig? So I'm just wondering, like... Um, Sorry about that. Um, I'm just wondering. Um, this is amazing historical information, but like, where if someone wanted to like dig in deeper, could you give them like resources, like where to go to like do <laughs> 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 your own books, of course. But if if they want to get deeper, where do you recommend they go? Luckily, there's been an explosion of historical writing in the last 20 years. Uh, before 20 years, you know, you could count the really good books that dealt with this stuff on one hand. Now there's hundreds of them. So, you know, go to any decent library, go online, type in gay history, and you'll get a long list, and some of it's very specialized. But as far as doing the research, doing this kind of research poses a lot of unique challenges because, uh, because being gay has been stigmatized so much, and especially in the 19th and most of the 20th century, a lot of gay people burned all their stuff or their family members would burn their diaries, burn their letters, burn any evidence that of this person's secret. And so we as historians are kind of, um, you know, there's big gaps in the record, and we know there's something there, but it's not there, so we can't talk about it. Luckily, though, I would say just in, especially the last 20 years, gay people, LGBT people themselves, have started to become more aware of their own history and archives have started to come around. I did all of my research at this place near USC. It's called the One National Gay and Lesbian Archives. It's the legacy of the magazine. Yeah, we want to hear that story. Yeah. This is the, the oldest gay institution in the country. Mm -hmm. It's been around since 1952, and, and the archive is sort of, you know, there's been a lot of incarnations of this institution, but they're an archive now. Okay. They have stuff, you know, I mean, it's just... Uh, thousands and thousands of boxes of people's papers, of publications, of rare books, artwork, any historical thing, scrap you can possibly imagine. The people who did this magazine started collecting this stuff as early in the 1940s. They would see things in newspapers that they thought, oh, I think they're talking about a gay person there. The newspaper wouldn't use the word, but they could just tell, and they'd clip it out and put it in a folder. All those folders hundreds of thousands of them are in that archive. So that's the sort of place you can go to and just plunge in. You can spend years there 
and barely dent the surface. There's also archives like this in New York City, uh, San Francisco, and other big cities that, that it's just pouring in right now, and there's so much information, we're just starting to get a grip on it. So how did you come upon the letters? Um, very luckily and very accidentally, actually. Um, when I went to the One Archives, they had just moved into a new building, appropriately enough, a former fraternity house which I always love the irony of that at, at so many <laughs> levels. Uh, it, was a, it was a house that I guess they had a hazing scandal. They got kicked off a of campus and, and some people figured out how to get um, all these materials there. At the time they were, at the time I went there, and this was in 2000, right when I started my grad program at USC, um, they didn't know what all they had. They had stuff in people's closets. It was a bunch of different collections that they were all putting in one place at the same time. And um, it wasn't like I couldn't just go do research. Like the, the stuff wasn't cataloged enough. I had, they didn't even know what they had. So I said to the guy basically the first time I showed up there, look, I'm interested in the 50s. I'm interested in McCarthyism. I'm interested in the anti-communist scare and how it impacted gay people because that's something that people had started writing about at that time. And, and he said, okay, look, See that utility room over there, this dank, dingy utility room with pipes everywhere? We got about 100 boxes in there, and we have no idea what's in them, but we know there's stuff from the 50s in there. So, so you go through them, you sort them out, tell us what's in there, and you can use whatever you find. Wow. And so, you know, for a grad student, like, a, you know, just done with my qualls, ready to think about a dissertation, this is like a dream come true. It's the best Christmas ever. So I go in there, and um, within, I guess, I think it was the second night I was there, I started finding these letters in boxes, thousands and thousands of them in their own handwriting, you know, the actual letters, not just copies of them. Um, I, you know, second I started finding them, I'm just like, oh, this is my dissertation. This is at least one book, maybe two books. You know, that was 15 years ago. So you didn't find the answers the way they were published in the magazine. You just found the letters the way they came in. I actually did find a lot of the responses because Dor Leg, this guy, the you who, yeah. who answered a lot of these letters, he, um, there were a lot of, um, what do you call it? Uh, mimeographs? Mimeo yes, yeah. mimeograph copies of the responses he sent. Mm -hmm. He tended to send pretty generic responses. Was he and, any good? Uh, he was an interesting guy. Let me say he was a very cranky guy. Ah. And he didn't always get along with people very well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes his crankiness came out in his responses. <laughs> He's somebody who actually had very little tolerance for self-pity. Mm -hmm. And when somebody would write in a letter saying, oh, poor me, my life is so hard, wah, wah. <laughs> Sometimes he'd let them have it, and he'd say, get a grip, you know? Don't just sit there and cry about it. Um, help us. Send us some money, oh. and, you know, we can, oh. yeah, he was definitely always So there was plugging. a plea within every response. Oh, absolutely, you know? Um, but this was a nonprofit. They were right, scrappy. Right. I mean, they, they were on the verge of bankruptcy the whole time, but um, so. Uh, can you read us uh, any, any letters that oh, yeah. you decided were worthy of inclusion in your book. Sure, sure. Um, let me say that Letters to One is just an edited collection of raw letters. In the, you know, the ones I thought were the most interesting ones. Masked Voices, the other mm -hmm. book here. Here we go. Um, is, Cut to me. Is basically my, my dissertation revised so that people might actually want to read it. You know, um, so it's my analysis and it's it's little snips of a thousand letters. And this is about 125 letters in their entirety. So you get kind of the uh, the whole sense of it here. Yeah. You know, I have one picked out if I can uh, find it here. Um, let's see. Well, this this one is uh, I picked this one because it's from a teenager. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, this is from 1964. It's from a small town in central Michigan. So imagine someone in some little small town in central Michigan uh, sitting down and writing this. Dear sir, today I received one magazine and the other information I requested. Thank you very much. Um, the magazine I found was thoroughly enjoyable to say the least. One of the main reasons I'm writing is because I'm sure what I say will be held in strictest confidence as a privileged communique. Of course, there's always a chance this will fall into the wrong hands, but that's a chance I must take. See, he's paranoid about wow. who might read this letter and who might find it. Wow. You see, I'm a homophile, and I'm 16 years old. 
homophile was kind of the word that a lot of these activists were using because mm-hmm. they thought the word homosexual had too much negative baggage. And okay. This was the word they wanted to sort of substitute in its place. It didn't work, but you, know, you see it a lot. You see, I'm a homophile and I'm 16 years old. Because of my age at present, um, I cannot support one or the homophile movement, but as soon as I'm of age, I plan to be very active. This is not just a figment of my my imagination that I'm gay. Last year, with the help of a local doctor and the school principal, I saw a psychiatrist without my parents' knowledge. Anyway, she, the psychologist, told me I was a, quote, true homosexual. For a long time, I was unhappy with my lot, no pun intended, as part of the lavender set, but after discovering that we were not uncommon or queer, I've come to accept it more or less. The book Christ and the Homosexual was a great help to adjusting myself, as also were several friends. Um, This book should be in every teenage homo's hands, along with the book Two by Jordan. It would certainly make their lives happier. The gay teenagers will be the leaders of the movement. Why are we excluded from it today when it could help so many? Some groups should be formed for the teenage gay crowd exclusively. There's plenty of material, both bi, gay, and hetero-gay. Not sure what he means by that, but that's interesting. We have a cause. Too many people, I fear, look at us as effing queers, as a peer told us. Our love can be beautiful, just as it can be ugly, but so with the straight crowd. Really, I can't see why we're classed as nuts of some kind. Wouldn't it be wonderful if homosexuals today could walk with head high, proud of the fact, instead of hiding in the dark crevices of society like medieval monsters? The society, which humorously we call civilization, has produced us and then regretted the fact, therefore rejecting us as freaks. A lot they've got to damn with their double standard of morality, or should I say, amorality. It goes on a while. Um, That kid is brilliant. It's amazing. He's 16 years old. It's 1964 that he's writing this. And this was something I found in so many of the letters, that there's already this kind of sense of gay pride that existed at a time before we think it existed. Of this righteous indignation. We assume that every gay person in the 50s and in the early 60s was depressed, suicidal, getting electroshock therapy, you know, suffering this horrible existence. And like I said, with the arrests, people were certainly suffering and there were profound differences between today and yesterday. When I sat down to read these letters, I was expecting a horror show. Mm -hmm. I was expecting to be depressed for the next 10 years of my life. And instead, what I found was that there was this internal strength, this collective courage that they drew from one another um, that that so often, um, you know, made them seem really not that different than today. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was reading, uh, you know, the questions that we have here. And I was just thinking, you know, these could have been letters to one magazine yes. in the 1950s. They're, oh. they're so similar. There's to a, a lot. lot of those letters. There's a lot that hasn't changed. Um, what has changed is, I, I think, a teenager's accessibility to an awareness that he or she is not alone. Absolutely. But that wouldn't change what's going on within the immediate uh, family structure, home structure, town structure, school structure, if it's sort of still steeped in. An, uh, an intolerance for mm-hmm. anything that, that that's vaguely different. If everyone is pretty much the same religion and everyone is supposed to you grow up and get married and, ha- and have children, um, then at 15, th- there's just as much despair and hopelessness as there was in 1950. Uh, I hope that's rapidly mm-hmm. changing. But um, do you guys want to dive into some questions that you know, could have come into one magazine in 1964. Um, This one is from Anonymous, and it says, I am confused about my sexuality. I think I'm bi, and I've told people I'm bi, but now I'm not so sure. Sometimes I think I'm not, but my mother even says she's noticed that I've liked girls since I was in third grade, and I even remember a few crushes that I didn't know were crushes at the time that were girls. I'm a girl, by the way. I know for sure I like guys, and I fell in, in love with a girl, but it was one girl and i haven't really liked many girls since only one but does being in love with one girl make you bisexual and does it get less confusing with time and how can i know for sure what my sexuality is it's just so confusing so the reason i included this letter is because this letter is typical of letters that i get from kids who do not know what they are and i'm wondering if if you 
stumbled upon similar letters where people are really questioning, does this make me gay? Did they? Oh, all the time. Mm-hmm. And and what word do I use? Right. And does it, you know, if, if I'm this, does it mean this or the other thing? And, um, you know, um, that confusion is uh, by design. That confusion is the byproduct of a repressive society that we still live in despite the rapid changes that are happening. So you think that if everybody were completely accepting of everything, then kids would be at 12 like, oh, it, I'm a, you, I still think that the process of growing up is a process which mandates a certain amount of push-pull with sense of self that that even even if you're going to just be straight and and never kind of question whether or not you're you're straight you're still going to struggle with sexual feelings and who am I and what type of person am I going to fall in love with is it this boy or that boy you are but you might not have the specific guilt ah. and specific sense of shame that comes with growing up in a in a you know, not just homophobic society, but a heteronormative society, Mm -hmm. a society that in which everything is geared around opposite sex couples, Mm -hmm. in which the stories you grow up hearing are always boy girl, in which all the movies you watch and all the TV show. Now that has all changed so much in just the last 10 or 20 years. You know, I think we're still kind of gauging that, but our institutions, our reactions, the way our society is built is still kind of, you know, uh, that word heteronormative kind of oriented in a way that a gay person will inherently feel excluded Mm -hmm. or left out. I mean, to me, what you're describing is, yes, every adolescent will will go through angst regardless of, of, you know, what their sexuality is, but there's specific forms of guilt and shame that I think LGBT people have internalized and had to struggle against um, kind of throughout the 20th century that that still linger. So let's get to her question. How would you answer it if she's only, let's just, there's a lot of really cool things in here, like her mother just saying, oh, well, I've noticed that you've noticed girls since third grade and her mother seems fine with that. So that's awesome. But if she's only had a crush on one girl... Does that make her bisexual? What's her age? I don't know what her age is. We always wonder See, what their ages are. That to me, that makes a big difference. If she's sometimes they say, if but she's thirteen versus twenty-three, I would let's give different advice. You all know? right, L- she's not thirty-three, so <laughs> okay. let's just say that she's thirteen or sixteen. Let's say that. I guess what I would say to this person, as a historian, mm-hmm. because I'm not a therapist, or you know, right. I don't have qualifications to really noted. give this sort of advice but let me just say that these words that she is struggling with how do I she's she seems to like trying to figure out what what word do I use to describe myself and how do I conceptual myself what what box do I put myself in and what I would say is that these words we use gay bi straight these are human inventions that we that are that are terms of convenience to try to make sense of an infinitely complex world. And they're always limited and they're always insufficient to some extent. And, you know, I would just say, you know, you're gonna fall in love with who you're gonna fall in love with. Mm -hmm. And whatever terms and whatever you are will just simply fall into place as you come into who you are and all sorts of other levels. And there are some things you're not supposed to know the answers to yet. Well, I don't know if it's a question of not supposed to knowing I mean I think some people know right away and mm-hmm. some people like me I didn't know I didn't know I was gay until I was in my mid-20s oh wow but but at another level I did know right but I wouldn't admit it to myself I was playing games with myself but I really truly believed up until my mid-20s that, no there's there's some rational explanation for all of these things mm-hmm. that make me different and then it was like oh, I'm gay. That explains everything. That just (laughs) explained every single thing about my life and things that I'd really suffered from, you know. Um, It took me a long time to get to that. And everyone kind of, everyone has their own journey. Right. You know, everyone has their own relationship with this stuff. No two people are ever the same. You know, one, one thing that helps me think through all this and another little historical note here. Um, back in the 1940s, there was this guy named Alfred Kinsey, 
Have you heard? I of, saw the movie. You saw the movie yeah. with Liam Neeson? Sure. Have, have you guys heard of Alfred Kinsey? Just from the Kinsey scale. Okay, yeah. Do, yeah. do you know what the Kinsey scale is? Yeah, yeah. Can, do you want to? Okay, so yeah, go um, for it. the Kinsey scale is, I guess, a more accurate way of um, defining sexuality. So instead of having the extremes of bi, gay, uh, um, straight, and all the other stuff, you just kind of like... Like, I don't remember which side is the straight side and which side's the gay side, but you kind of just, like, plop yourself somewhere on the scale. Uh-huh. Um, spectrum 1 so to 10. So yeah. it's, like, it more, like, because people can be in between any of those things. All of those labels are just extremes. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, Kinsey, that, that's excellent. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, this was his breakthrough, that, that sexuality is a spectrum. It's a continuum. These boxes don't always fit for people. And... and Kinsey took thousands and thousands of sexual case histories, you know, he interviewed thousands and thousands of people, and I would say his big breakthrough he had um, was that no two were ever the same. Of the thousands of men and women, t like 15,000, some huge astounding number, mm -hmm. no two human beings ever had quite the same exact sexual history or sense of sexual health. But you know what my favorite message of the film, I thought, was? Was that he, he felt, he and his wife felt like they, they could study sexuality just completely abstractly, but what they found was that sexuality is intricately interwoven with emotions and that you cannot just s laboratory study sexuality without your emotions becoming very involved, and I thought that was fascinating. Many criticized Kinsey for that, for, for being what they called an orgasm counter. That, <laughs> that was what he boiled sexuality But, but in the film, to. he finds himself having feelings for various people, his wife getting jealous, having feelings for various people that are on their team, and they're all, they, they, were, they got themselves completely sort of entangled yeah, in every possible I, I, way. Honestly, I think the movie played that up oh, a little, did? you know, for, for soap opera type drama. Yeah, but, perhaps. But I mean... This was something he was always up against, was mm -hmm. people saying, how can you just reduce it to these statistical things? And, and I'm a big defender of Kinsey because he was the first person to just sit down and count this stuff and to but, come up with some of the, like, like the thing about the Kinsey scale that's so, I think, amazing and profound was that, you know, was how many people fall into that middle, you mm -hmm. know, how many people aren't gay, full on identified, but not totally straight either about half of the men he interviewed were somewhere in the middle you know and they, they these weren't people who would identify as, as gay right. these were simply people who in a certain situation in a certain context called prison prison the military um whatever well, drunk just like who you fall in love with sometimes right but i but what i what i liked about the movie was the message that you can't just play around with sex because your emotions are going to get involved and that's a big thing that has to be taken into account kids when you become sexually active that, that is true that is yeah. a good point uh and so uh oh is jordan on the phone no all right so uh you wanted to you wanted to say something to our anonymous letter writer regarding uh her crush on a girl yes thank you for reminding me um so essentially like your answer i think that was actually very interesting because like my initial reaction to this question is Oh, well, you know, you're going to like who you like, and, like, the label might be important for, like, contextual reasons and for, like, you know, growing up, being very young and needing... Being on Tumblr. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. But, like, but like more importantly, to be able to see, okay, so there's other people who I can identify with expressly who have, who have made it, right? And I know that I can also exist fine, because they have also existed fine, right? Mm -hmm. But, like, I'm wondering... Like my initial my initial reaction, that was my second thought. But my initial reaction is, oh well, you know, why does it matter? You're going to like who you like. It's all okay. It's like I'm like, but I think I'm coming from kind of like a, a privileged perspective of, um, both being straight and also being in Southern California, where it's a little I think more easygoing about about this stuff in America. And um, then I think I think it was interesting to hear it from your different perspective, saying mo very much a similar thing. And I think, um, hopefully. Like that's where kind of we're headed. Like that we it it won't be such a terrible like oh gosh I need to know because 
it'll be equally represented, right? Yeah. And right, I guess or there won't be any shame involved in either alternative, so that if you want to be somewhere in the middle or one or the other, you're just like kind of figuring it out along the way without without what doing kind of what Craig did, which is like saying like suspending your disbelief until the age of twenty four because it was life was gonna be so much easier if you only were straight. Exactly. But it just turns out you weren't. Right. right. And, but I guess like where that leads is like how do you think we're doing? Like because I, I, I've always had this feeling that it was kind of generational and like very much so and like the next generation after my own probably hopefully we would get there because it feels from my own experience that my generation's light years beyond the, the last one even if they are also well intentioned yeah no you guys are awesome let me tell you as a, as a college instructor the mood in the classroom just when I talk about these things is a hundred percent different than when I was an undergrad in college 20 years ago Really? In, in the early 90s. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, things were tolerated then that aren't tolerated now in terms of faggot and, and, and certain words, you know, wow. that people say. And um, just the assumptions are changing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, when I went to college and this is just after the, the horrible 1980s, you know, um, you know, I think the mentality was if you're gay, you deserve to be bullied because you're gay. It was like this circular logic. And, and well, I mean, that's what do you expect? It was just this kind of surrendering to the fact that if you're gay you're gonna have to withstand certain amounts of harassment and terror and bullying and i and one thing that um i'm not hearing as much of that i still heard a couple of years ago was people your age still though referring using the word gay uh -oh. as a generic negative oh, yeah. oh that's so gay and does that do you guys still say there, that there was a big pushback there was pushback? a big pushback yeah. good good <laughs> there was a whole like ad campaign on TV about it, but I remember like being a kid in middle school and that was just like everybody just said gay and that's what it was and it was actually like really homophobic and inside of two or three years everybody was like, Oh, you can't say that and then so that became like a thing. I've <laughs> noticed it's disappeared and I <laughs> yeah. was wondering about that. And, and, and it's so weird because it was just like while I was in middle school and then as soon as I switched to high school, like that was it. <laughs> but um, so when I was a kid, people said that's so queer and mm -hmm. I did not know that queer meant gay or anything uh -huh. LGBT. I just thought it meant stupid. And, uh -huh. uh, and, then, and then kids started saying gay and I guess other people who were older than me knew that queer meant uh -huh. queer, but I didn't know it. Uh, so maybe there's always been a word for that that was a derogatory <laughs> word, but maybe we're evolving out of that. Anyway, go ahead, Montana. Oh, but um, I had a question, like, specifically about her question. So I noticed there's a lot of really, really hyper-specific LGBT terms for, like, uh, what specific kind of sexuality you are or you think you are. But is there an all-encompassing term for just kind of, like, what I consider myself is sexually mushy? So it's just kind <laughs> of, like whoever uh, ironically it is the word queer now oh. which has been reclaimed you know it's a good word you know when, <laughs> a, when a minority has had a word used against it often with violent overtones one part of the civil rights process is to right. reclaim that word make okay. it your own appropriate it. Own it and and the word queer is um very popular among uh -huh. i'd say college age and younger okay. uh students who don't who feel uncomfortable with the word gay or lesbian for maybe certain specific reasons. Or even bi. Or, or bi. Yeah. Bi's, bisexuality is a very complicated concept, you know, mm -hmm. and it's uh -huh. something almost everyone is, but few people use that word to describe themselves. Mm -hmm. Although, again, different historical moments, it's different. In the 70s, mm -hmm. everyone was bi. In the 1920s, everyone was bi. And then really? it comes and goes in these yeah. weird weird waves. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. But, but there's this whole realm of academia. It's called queer theory. <laughs> you know, if you, when you go to college, you can you can take classes and read about queer theory, which is kind of cool. um, deconstructing and analyzing these words, gay, homosexual, where do they come from? What do they mean? Um, I think for a lot of people, especially people of color, um, the word gay has this whiteness built into it. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of African-American, Latino young men, they just... It, this, the word gay doesn't feel culturally right to them, mm -hmm. I think, because race and ethnicity does create some walls within the gay community. Yeah. And, and in the past, you know, there has been just as much racism in the gay community as you, as you have in other places. I didn't even know that. Yeah, wow. yeah. This, we're not all perfect, you know. <laughs> I, I know it's hard to say that. But, uh -huh. um, but um, a, a lot, you know, this is something that I think in the 90s really started to get going, you know, the idea of queer and how people who just didn't quite feel like they met that 
gay ideal. Um, started using that, and it's really grown. It is, it's interesting you use the word mushy, because the, the term, the criticism I have of the word queer is that it is very mushy. Uh -huh. It's like it can mean anything or nothing or all these things at once, uh -huh. but but it has a lot of power for exactly uh -huh. what you're describing yeah. for being this just just completely broad, all-encompassing word uh -huh. that means okay, I'm I'm not straight in the conventional mainstream uh -huh. way. I'm something else, but I'm not quite sure exactly what, call what that and is. And I didn't even know queer was like okay to say. I thought it was another thing like before high school hit and things started to be more like. Um, uh, less homophobic, like queer was still kind of a derogatory. Context is everything yeah. here. It depends who's using it and how it's used. Rody. I think also part of why like our generation is gravitating more towards queer is the term is that it doesn't have gendered connotations yes. the way like lesbian, gay, and bi all do. Absolutely. So it doesn't like have to take into account either your gender or like the gender of anyone you're attracted to. Or the gender like, you were born with, sort of. That's sex. Huh? Like what you were born with would be sex. Gender is how you identify. Right, but if but queer would take into account if you were trans, like... Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah, and it doesn't... Because, yeah, like, straight and gay yeah. are, like, both fitting into the gender binary, mm -hmm. and queer allows for much more variation. Right. Absolutely. Which makes it Fluid. Yeah, a lot more accessible. Absolutely, yes. Gender and sexual fluidity. Those are the key hot things that college professors are talking about i think they're i think they're they're fantastic and they're inclusive and we're coming into like sort of an age of in inclusion because there's so many terms that kids will find at least how they feel that moment somewhere online and then they get that even when you when you read the, the way the list is defined you read within that description that these things these things are ever evolving and you may feel this one way today i get letters from kids where they'll say today i do feel like a boy and yesterday i did not feel like a, like a boy so i know that there are people who you know, they don't really know who how to identify and they don't even know if it's going to be the same tomorrow and so if you see online oh that's that according to Kinsey and everyone else who's been studying this, that there's no two people alike. I mean, what a wonderful thing to find out. There's no normal. That for me was so liberating. Yeah. And it was so mind blowing that, that I could just be myself. Yeah. And I didn't have to be this thing, you know, that I had always imagined gay being. Because when I, when I look at Caitlyn Jenner, I'm just like, why would you want to wear that stuff? <laughs> if I had to be a girl in the 1800s, I would have been transgender because I cannot wear that stuff that he, she wants to wear. So I'm the same as her. I don't identify with, you guys see the way I dress, I don't identify girly girl. And so my mother was probably wondering, is she gay? What, you know, is she, you know, so there's a convenient term tomboy that, that I kind of like adopted because that worked for me. But what if that hadn't been a term? Mm -hmm. then I would have just been a complete freak, which I sort of was. This but is one of, you know, one of the interesting things I've learned about the transgender movement just from teaching it um, is that there's a very big divide within that community between people who do, I guess you would say, buy into the notion of gender binaries, mm -hmm. buy into the concept of male and femaleness, male and female in this wholesale like you're describing with Caitlyn Jenner or me I, I don't feel completely female and then then there's this you know uh, other category of transgender people who who are very comfortable in the middle you know not transitioning from one to the mm -hmm. other but being something completely distinct and unique right and often those two factions can uh uh disagree on a lot of things oh <laughs> I see yeah d priorities and what do we reject the gender binary or do we, as Caitlyn Jenner seems to be doing, uphold the gender binary mm -hmm. by being so girly girly? By saying, you know? I've picked a side and I'm crossing over to it. Right, right. Um, let's take a phone call real quick before you read the next letter. Sure. Hello. Thank you for calling. We are now Journals Out Loud. Are you completely comfortable with that? Yeah. All right. Who's this? Space Ghost. <gasps> Space Ghost. Wonderful. Do you have a statement or a question for us or for our guest, Craig? Um, I'm trans, and I don't really know my sexuality, so I just go with queer. So I'm cool with that. Mm -hmm. So that. And, um, I have. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. 
Um, I had a question for Craig. Mm-hmm. Um, what age do you think it's okay to tell your children about LGBT people? Because my mom doesn't want to tell my sister about it. I can't really come out in my house. Oh, how what old do you think is... How old is she? Nine. She's nine. Okay, go ahead, Craig. Well, again, qualification. I'm not a childhood development expert, mm-hmm. but it would seem to me that um, when children learn about sexuality, whenever that is, whenever they learn about the birds and the bees, there should be well, some... My sister knows about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, it, it would be helpful for your sister just to, to maybe know that there are people who are attracted to, who fall in love with this people of this. I mean... It seems to me if you're a nine-year-old living in this society, you're, you're going to be aware of gay people just from watching TV and, and maybe just curious about that. And Space Ghost um, is identifying as trans. Uh-huh. And so I guess her mother is maybe not wanting her sister to know, oh, there might be some people that aren't comfortable with the th- parts they were born with or don't feel right in that body uh maybe that's she thinks that's too confusing for your sister or she might think it's contagious and that your sister would would you know honestly if i had to say an age maybe just say uh 12 13 just just if if, if it's a problem in the household if it would cause a rift if, if if your mother feels strongly about these things uh 12 13 uh bodily bodily changes happen and that to me would seem like the most opportune moment to mention these things. Are you tempted to tell her yourself? Yeah, because I'm out to literally everybody, and like my house is like the only place I'm not out at. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And I'm, it feels like it should be the opposite way. Like I could be out at home. But I not know. Out doesn't that feel? Else? That feels counterintuitive, doesn't it? Uh, Andre has something for you. Yeah. Um, back in the day when I, um, well, like I didn't really learn about closer to the mic honey i wasn't i didn't really learn about gay people um i just knew that they were part of our society like um i remember one time when i was a kid uh my parents told me like oh we're out gonna go to get some food and um apparently it was a restaurant with a gay bar like mixed into it Mm -hmm. so for me as a little kid like I i just um my mom just like, oh, yeah, this is partially a gay bar. Uh, yeah, deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, just eat your food. <laughs> if you have any questions, ask me later. Uh-huh. So I kind of grew up uh, not really having an opinion. Like, it wasn't really a releva- uh, relevation? It's a me? revelation. Revelation. Yeah. yeah. There was no me. judgment attached to it for you. Yeah. It was just... So as a person who grew up like that, I think that's how kids... Um, should be told about gay people without judgment, just completely objective, and you can choose whether you want to be part of that society or not. Yeah, and I think your mom is seeing it from her eyes as this is going to be a groundbreaking piece of information for your sister, where your sister will probably go, oh yeah, I knew something was up, and she'll be happy that you confided in her. Uh, uh, Aaron. So I am always of the opinion that uh, what's going on in your household if you cannot leave the household reasonably and like go out on your own is probably kind of best to adhere to for your own sake. Um, and that sucks. Um, I would maybe have another conversation with your mom about this just because like maybe she's being short sighted and is thinking that your sister doesn't, doesn't know things that she actually does know. And, um, maybe convince her to even have like conversations about things more generally, not even with you there, between your mom and your sister, see how that goes, put out feelers. And uh, don't try to go behind her back, I think. That's not going to probably end well, but I think this is a workable situation. If if your mom's having this conversation with you at this point, to push it a little farther steps at a time. Just Mon- just don't go behind her back. Montana? Okay. Um. So personally, I don't think there should be an age limit when kids can learn about like LGBTism because that's a part of who they are. They might be LGBT. Like how I learned was I was um, my babysitters when I was really, really young, like three. They were like a gay couple 
and so they were the best i still love them um but uh yeah so i just kind of grew up knowing knowing it was a thing i also grew up thinking that like um what's it called when like you're, you're in a freeway but you're married polygamy i thought that was like completely normal too and apparently it's like not so um yeah but for some reason i was like really like surprised when i learned that lesbians were a thing but like gay guys were just like completely normal uh-huh. i think it was just the word because i thought it sounded like lebanese and i <laughs> right i was confused it was confusing too i thought it was people from I thought lebanon they liked a certain kind of bread yeah yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> it's like these ladies who wear a lot of crocs and eat this bread pita bread right all right we're but gonna let you go space ghost um we, um, and Craig's going to read another letter from his book. Go ahead. Well, this will just, I don't know, it's very interesting talking about transgender, the, the confusion that comes along with, you know, transgender identity and just labels and uncertainty. This is um, from um, a woman. She identifies as a woman from Baltimore, Maryland, also in 1964. And I'm just going to read the beginning here. Dear sir, I don't know if you get letters from people with a real big problem or if you can help them, but I do know I need help and you are my last hope. If after reading this you can help me at all, I'd be most grateful. It's going to be hard to put my problem into writing, but I'll try to get all the facts across. You see, outwardly, I'm a woman, but inside I have a male's emotions. In fact, at times, I become two different people, for a while I'm a woman, and even, lack, even act like one, then all of a sudden I'm a man. This change doesn't show on the outside, only on the inside. I never know when this change is going to happen, it just does. Only one fact remains permanent, that is, I have no love or emotions for men. I only fall in love with other girls, but not all the time because I don't seek feminine company. What I mean is, here in Baltimore, there's a place called Cicero where lesbians hang out. Since I don't consider myself a lesbian, I don't hang out there and try to pick up some girl. I want another girl's company, but I won't look for it. She has got to come to me because she wants to or else it's no go. I don't think someone should be forced to live or associate with someone who isn't normal. Then she goes on basically saying how lonely she is. Aww. And so it's kind of a, a sad letter. There's but a lot of like self-loathing in there that is definitely has been inflicted on her by society. Absolutely. Or, or her perceived expectations of society. And it's just fascinating to me to read her say, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely certain I only love women, but I'm not a lesbian. Yeah. You know, but, but she says she changes her, ide- her gender identity spontaneously inside. I was like listening there's to so a, much happening. There's a lot going on with her. <laughs> so I was listening to a podcast where they were they were interviewing someone who some days felt like a man and some days felt like a woman. I, um, I was thinking that would be really really confusing, and mm. I I'm wondering why that happens and why or why that would be a thing or or you know if we're if there's a creator why we're created in a way that can be so confusing. Um, for us the struggle to make sense out of everything it, i think it makes everything beautiful and there's there's beauty in the discovery of of self and of each other and coming together as a society to help help each other feel better is you know a part of what what i love about it all as hard as it feels um so here's a letter from forever is there any chance I can get a friend that understands me? I'm lesbian, and every time I tell someone, they avoid me at all costs. I'm hoping maybe someone in. And then she mentioned all these towns in Ohio, <laughs> <laughs> which I which I kind of like blurred out because I don't want kids being too specific about where they live. But that kind of desperation is so similar to the letter that you just read. There's it's like her going into an app on her phone and just saying, "I need a friend who's going to love me." Not some version of me that I'm pretending to be just because I need, uh, uh, you know, I need to make it through the rest of the day, but like the actual me. And what I tell them is like just around the next corner, there's a whole flood of people and you just have to slog it through high school. And then the moment you step onto a college campus, it's like the heavens open and you're like, "Ah." not only is everybody going to love you, they're going to be like you. (laughs) 
and uh, but how do you get them past high school? Because we have s- so many kids are at risk during high school because of they feel so much despair. So what would you say to Forever Craig? Oh, well, I, your advice is is just right. It, it, you know, the, just wait and it'll happen. You know, and it might take longer than you want it to, but you will ultimately be a much stronger person for all that waiting that you're you're going through. Um, let me just say that I feel proud to live in the uh, first state in the country, California, to pass legislation requiring LGBT history in the K through 12 levels. Really? Yes, that was just passed a, a year or two ago. <laughs> Not just now, but it, this is something that is just starting right now. Wow. And, uh, you know, um, so gay history will be in the high school curriculum starting very shortly what are going to be some of the excellent lessons what can we what can you teach us about gay history that will make every kid listening to this podcast feel better about him or herself the kinsey reports that's in there (laughs) oh yeah that that'll i mean that'll be in there the stonewall riots you know, which Explain the Stonewall riots, because I'm not sure everyone on, on our panel um, is familiar with that. It, it happened in what year? 1969 okay. in Greenwich Village, New York City. Um, this was a kind of sleazy dive uh, bar with a lot of gay, transgender, kind of working class, a lot of non-white clientele. It used to get routinely raided, and one day the patrons fought back. And it was a there was a series of violent street confrontations between hundreds of police and hundreds of of gay people that went on for about a week. And the police ultimately retreated, and it became this very important symbolic moment. And a year later, the very first wave of gay pride festivals and parades happened that were in commemoration of Stonewall. So the, the riot is important, but even more important than that is it fuels the concept of having the idea that people need to be visible and we need to go express our pride because all we do is get shame from society basically Mm -hmm. so um it's often seen as the beginning of the gay rights movement but as i said it it actually been going on since the early 50s and let's touch a moment before we end the show on the research you're doing now about 80s music videos because i really am in love with this I grew up watching MTV, you know, during my adolescence. Um, And looking back on it now, I'm shocked at just how many queer performers there were. Some of the biggest ones, Mm -hmm. you know, not obscure people, but like Wham, Culture Club, Elton John. I mean, just on and on. These were the biggest stars of the day. Sure. Yet um, the word gay was never used. It was implied. Well, sometimes in different ways, in different levels of eliminate. There so was I'm a lot of eyeliner. There a was a lot, lot of eyeliner in the eighties. Exactly. And so I'm just I'm fascinated by the parallels between the nineteen fifties and the nineteen eighties. Both repressive moments for mm-hmm. different reasons, one of which I grew up in. And so I'm trying to figure out what effect did watching all those videos have on me? To what extent did watching those videos keep me in this state of denial? for as long as it did because of the video's lack of acknowledgement Ah. that these people were gay. I'm saying it, for me at that time, it would have made a big difference in my life to have that acknowledged rather than merely implied Mm -hmm. because then it's a guessing game and when it can't be acknowledged, that tells a 12-year-old child, oh, that's something really bad. Repress. And plus, the 1980s was a time when, you know, pardon my language, the word faggot was thrown around so commonly, so frequently, in every possible situation um, that you learn very early on that being gay is the absolute worst thing a human being could possibly be. And how much did the AIDS crisis impact that? Huge, because I, you know, I came of age right when the, the AIDS crisis was starting to have a lot of publicity. And I would say for most of the 1980s, I simply associated being gay with dying of AIDS, one in the same. And that's how it was presented in the media. And so I had this this mindset that was very hard to get out of and to undo that, well, if I'm gay, I'm going to die of AIDS. So I don't want to die of AIDS, so I'm not going to be gay. And I'll just will it away or do this or do that or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took me a long time to get past that. Wow. 
Well, you'll have to come back and talk more about this. Sure. Because it's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for being with us, Craig Thank you for Lofton. having me. <laughs> and we are Journals Out Loud, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Good job, panel. I've been out there wandering. I've been in here wandering. Hoping, reaching, or wishing I could find my way. Then I found. Yo